Welcome. We're moving on now to Section 4 of the presentation titled, New Options in the Treatment of Negative and Cognitive Symptoms of Schizophrenia. We've already discussed the negative and cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia as symptom categories. We discussed the NMDA receptor with its two neurotransmitters, glycine and glutamine. We discussed sarcosine, a natural glycine transporter type 1 inhibitor. And finally, we'll discuss anacetylcysteine, which is an antioxidant precursor to glutathione production. It should be known that anacetylcysteine has been shown in research to noticeably improve the negative and positive symptoms of schizophrenia. As this nutrient was well tolerated, that benefits may be especially large for negative symptoms, and that research showing that anacetylcysteine improves symptoms of schizophrenia is consistent with research showing that glutathione levels are depleted in schizophrenia, and that N-acetylcysteine can improve these levels substantially. N-acetylcysteine increases glutathione production by providing a normally limited precursor in human metabolism, namely cysteine. N-acetylcysteine is used every day in emergency rooms around the country to rescue patients that are at risk of liver failure due to Tylenol overdose and the toxicity associated with Tylenol in the liver. Tylenol depletes the liver of glutathione, and if this process reaches critical levels, patients can lose their organ to failure. Providing anesthetocysteine to these patients can increase glutathione production in the liver and actually rescue them from failure. Anesthetocysteine can likely protect the brain as well by increasing glutathione in these areas. Glutathione is actually the body's master antioxidant. We have a number of different endogenous antioxidants, antioxidants that we create, and glutathione is considered by many to be one of the most important. It provides strong protection from environmental toxins and from the toxic byproducts of energy metabolism that occur in our bodies every day. It protects against the toxic breakdown products of dopamine, which is a specific issue in schizophrenia that I'll discuss in a future slide. And it may help protect neurons and improve detoxification directly. It's also known as one of the most common peptides in the brain, which shows its essential nature for function. Glutathione levels have been shown repeatedly to be low in schizophrenia, and this issue really cannot be overstated as far as its importance. Levels were reduced by 27% in the cerebral spinal fluid of patients with schizophrenia compared to controls in one study. In that same study, looking at the medial prefrontal cortex, levels were only 52% of those in controls. This area of the brain is very important in schizophrenia and in general function. It's involved in planning, memory, and impulse control. And levels of glutathione at this level are likely to be devastating. In a different study, in the, looking at the condate of patients with schizophrenia, 41% decreases in the levels of glutathione were seen. And it's likely that these low levels of glutathione and the damage that may occur to decreased antioxidant protection may lead to the caudate being smaller than average in schizophrenia. This area, the caudate, is important in feedback processes and alerts us to important actions and information. It's important in memory and emotional processing as well. Impaired synthesis of glutathione may be partly what's at work in these situations in the schizophrenia. It's known that a bad genetic copy for glutamate cysteine ligase gene is common in schizophrenia. And this actually is the rate limiting step for glutathione synthesis. But it's likely that other factors are also at work uh, given that glutathione depletion uh, is a multifactorial process. Depletion may actually occur from increases in dopamine breakdown. It's known that when dopamine is broken down by monoamine oxidase B, a hydroxyl radical is created when hydroxy hydrogen peroxide mixes with reduced iron ions. The hydroxyl radical is actually one of the worst radicals that we know of and is known to attack proteins, enzymes, carbohydrates, fats, and even DNA. Hydroxyl radicals are known to damage brain tissue directly, 
and in cases where glutathione is depleted, the damage that occurs through hydroxyl radical production can be devastating. Depletion also impairs the ability to detoxify from other toxins, and this detoxification process increases uh, damage further in a sort of vicious cycle mode. Um, as damage accelerates, baseline defenses can be breached, and once these defenses are breached, damage leads to more damage, again, in a vicious cycle mode uh, that's difficult to stop. Multiple lines of evidence also point towards free radical formation and oxidative stress as a factor in schizophrenia. It's known that glutathione is often depleted in this disorder, but it's also known that other antioxidants, uh, both endogenous and uh, exogenous um, antioxidants taken in through nutrition, are often depleted. Symptom improvement in schizophrenia that may occur through n acetylcysteine may occur through multiple mechanisms. Uh, for one thing, production, protection from the increased oxidative damage that we see in schizophrenia may be at work. Uh, we know that there is, there are increased levels of general oxidative uh, inflammation going on in the brain in patients with schizophrenia and improvement of glutathione levels may generally improve protection from this issue. It increases glutathione, which specifically it probably improves detoxification. And acetylcysteine and glutathione may improve NMDA receptor function directly by acting as reductants. Uh, glutathione has the power to add electrons to other molecules, and the NMDA receptor appears to work better in this environment. They also may actually increase glutamate in the synapse while simultaneously providing protection to the neuron. And protection against excited toxicity and calcium-related damage. And these molecules may even increase calcium flux through the NMD receptor directly. The first study I want to show you is from La Voix in Neuropsychopharmacology in 2008, titled Glutathione Precursor in Acetylcysteine Improves Mismatch Negativity in Schizophrenia Patients. Mismatch negativity is considered to be a measurement tool for generally assessing NMDA receptor dysfunction, and it is considered to be a large contributing factor to schizophrenia. It measures brain wave changes that occur when a repeated sound suddenly changes pitch. Poor MMN signal strength is considered to be a strong reproducible deficit in schizophrenia. In this study, they looked at changes in brain electricity, or EEG, in patients that were given anacetylcysteine or placebo and were allowed to continue taking their typical medication regimens, which included atypical antipsychotics. The study was randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled. It was a 60-day study with crossover to the other agent for 60 more days and included 11 patients with schizophrenia versus 11 healthy controls. Regarding results, and the cysteine was effective in correcting one of the major sensory deficits that's believed to contribute broadly to the symptoms of schizophrenia. In other words, MMN signal improved over four times compared to that seen with placebo. And the cysteine also significantly improved auditory cortical function. And the results that we're seeing are not found to be due to differences in selective attention or the ability of the patient to focus, or due to general EEG brain power levels. It's also nice to know that N-acetylcysteine was successful in this study at significantly increasing blood levels of glutathione. The second study I'd like to show you is Burke and others in biological psychiatry in 2008 titled N-acetylcysteine as a glutathione precursor for schizophrenia, double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. This group evaluated the safety and efficacy of adding one gram of N-acetylcysteine twice per day to the regular medication regimen of patients with schizophrenia. It was a 24-week trial, which is quite a long study in schizophrenia, and included 140 patients with schizophrenia. 
It was double-blinded and placebo-controlled, and outcomes were measured on the PANS subscales, positive, negative, and general. Some considerations while reading the outcomes of this study, it should be known that patients in the study had significant sense of severity. Uh, many were on clozapine, which reflected a likelihood of significant treatment resistance. Uh, this study was quite long compared to other schizophrenia treatment studies. And it's possible that patients with mild, mild symptoms might improve even more than is seen in this study. This is a graph looking at the percentage in improvement in symptom categories and subcategories in the study, uh, looking at placebo versus n acetylcysteine And as you can see, uh, the patients receiving n acetylcysteine showed significant improvement compared to placebo. Pretty much across the board, uh, we see benefits, although the benefits in the negative symptom categories are larger than those seen uh, with with in, and in other symptom categories. Specifically regarding results, the overall improvement in this NAC group was significant with negative symptoms showing the highest improvement. General symptom severity was reduced by 9.1% versus 0.75% in the placebo group. And akathisia symptoms, which measure the inner restlessness of patients that is often seen when taking uh, neuroleptics improved by 24% in patients taking n acetylcysteine while actually worsening in the placebo group. They did not note any difference between patients taking clozapine versus other neuroleptics in this study. And of note, the effects of n acetylcysteine grew significantly over the four months that the study looked at effects. And as such, it may require a couple of months to assess the effects of n acetylcysteine if it's used in clinical situations. Benefits were actually lost over four weeks after stopping n acetylcysteine, and no reported adverse effects or side effects were seen. Specifically, regarding the negative symptoms, these were measured, in, measured through a subscale of the original CAMS and improved by 10.6%. This represented more than 10 times the improvement that was seen with placebo. This aspect of the PANS assess, assesses emotional withdrawal, social apathy, poor conversational capacity, blunted affect, poor rapport and interpersonal connectedness, poor abstract thinking, and stereotype thinking. Regarding the total symptoms measured to the original PANS, these symptoms improved by 8.9%. And this represented more than 10 times the improvement that was seen with placebo. The, uh, this area assessed some of the positive and the general symptoms of schizophrenia as well. And if you'd like to see a full copy of the PANS to understand the full range of symptoms assessed, please see other areas of this website for a copy 